Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back from the lunch. Some people, as I heard already, uh, have not finished their lunch yet, but we hope that they will join us soon. Uh, so, uh, let us start one of the most interesting and uh, most important sessions of this conference. And uh, this is about Estonian experience and worldwide experience of internet voting. We are asking how to guarantee that internet voting is possible and security of internet voting is guaranteed. Before I give the floor to our excellent speakers, Professor Alexander Trexel, Mr. Christian Weissel, uh, Mr. Robert Krimmer, Mr. Alo Heinzalo and Mr. Pete Winkle, I would say some introductory words. Uh, remote internet voting, as almost everyone knows, allows voters to vote from any internet connected computer anywhere in the world. As said our president, Mr. Thomas Hendrik Illes, in his speech on Monday, Estonian solution is simple, refined, and secure. That's how most of Estonian people, me included, think about it. But of course, this sky is not bright. There are some clouds because information society has brought us also cybercrime and more serious cyber threats than ever before. I think most of you have read a huge load of scientific and non-scientific papers about cyber threats and information society problems. I hope that our excellent speakers will address these problems as well. Before uh, they start their presentations, I just remember two important details of Estonian internet voting system. One, of course, is the ID card. I, I hope you know it very well, as uh, the conference has lasted for three days already. But um, this is the highest level remote authentication tool. And it's mandatory for all uh, residents of Estonia. And it's the cornerstone and basement of the whole Estonian internet voting system. Second, the principle of secrecy. For scholars uh, on the soft fields, like myself, it means constitutional law, uh, policy, it's the most difficult question. Is it possible to guarantee secrecy and free voting in case of remote internet voting or remote postal voting? Actually, principally, it's the same. According to our constitutional understanding, the principle of secrecy consists of two sub-principles. Privacy of the Voting Act and anonymity of the vote. The latter can be technically guaranteed, the first cannot. The same problem, of course, by the remote postal voting. Our Supreme Court has decided that the right to replace electronically given vote with another internet vote or paper ballot is the proper way to guarantee freedom of voting and compensate possible lack of privacy. That is the understanding which is common to your Estonian and Norwegian system. Again, a fact what was already mentioned by Mr. President and I think by some other speakers also, Estonia has used countrywide remote internet voting since 2005. We have used it twice in local elections, twice in parliamentary elections and once in European Parliament election. The number of internet voters has grown sharply from less than 10,000 voters in 2005 to over 140,000 this year. The latter accounts for 24.3% of all votes cast and it is uh, 56% of all advance votes given, more than a half. 
The share of remotely given votes is similar in Estonia to Germany, by the way, because in Germany, uh, one fifth of voters usually use remote postal voting. Why internet voting? Ask some modern times Luditz. In Estonia as well, and also worldwide. I hope here also that uh, our speakers and you, the uh, audience, uh, will contribute to this discussion. Do we need internet voting or do we not need it? But the fact is that uh, social changes have already forced countries to allow remote postal or proxy voting. Estonia does not allow these voting methods except uh, remote postal voting from abroad, but only in uh, parliamentary elections and referenda. And I think, but uh, I hope to hear some critical remarks in this, uh, in this aspect also, but I think that uh, it's not possible to hold on to old traditions one single election day and uh, casting the paper ballot. It's not possible anymore because people are mobile, they use and need e-services, and the countries get more and better prepared to offer these services as secure as needed. So we should ask, is it possible to allow this kind of e-services and internet voting and offer security in the same time. How to do it? The Council of Europe has adopted recommendation and guidelines for electronically enabled elections and OSCE, whose representative, Mr. Robert Kramer, is here and is going to talk about it and about the recommendations uh, made for Estonia is looking for ways to observe and evaluate various forms of e-voting, including internet voting. And here I will conclude my introduction, and it's very good that uh, those people who were not here in the, at the 2 o'clock, they are here now, so we can start, actually, the most intriguing part of our session. And uh, to, just to conclude my introduction, we have to say that we are facing the pressure of the information society. People require e-services yet. On the other hand, cyber threats are more serious than ever before. And now, the time is so wide that uh, I would like to ask Mr. Alo Heinsalo, who is the Vice Chair of the National Electoral Committee of Estonia, to take the floor. and. Uh, to start with a detailed overview of Estonian internet voting system. Please, Alan. Thank you, Ulla. Ladies and gentlemen, as the main topic of our session is e-voting, my presentation deals with the basics of the electoral system of Estonia. Uh, always some few points of the de development of the election management and especially the methods of the voting as well to how the internet voting uh, have been influenced the traditional voting. Uh, in Estonia we have a uh, lot of types of election. Uh, we have uh, three types of general elections. And um, uh, since 1992, in the base of the uh, uh, new constitution, took place. Uh, of course, 1992, after restoring the independence in the beginning of the 90s, uh, we have um, um, 14 elections, general elections, and two referendums during the 20 years. Um, 
That means that we have a lot of uh, experience to manage election, elections uh, and uh, I think that our, um, the main principles of our electoral system uh, are this time have a good resistance. Uh, some words about uh, about uh, main principles. We have uh, Estonian citizens have attained 18 years of age in parliament election, and Estonian citizens and non-citizens resides on the basis of the long-term residence permit have attained, of course, the 18 years of age in municipality elections have right to vote. That means that we have a little bit less than one million voters in the parliamentary elections and a little bit more than one million uh, voters in the municipality elections. The electorate is approximately one million. Uh, we have the, in parliament ele elections uh, multi major districts and this base the number of the citizens uh, in the, entitled to vote in the districts. And the uh, electoral system based to the eight, 12 districts, we use the simple quota and modified don't methods open a closed list and we have the Vipros and national threshold. I jumped uh, away from the quite complicated uh, uh, system of verifying the mandates and that, uh, I think that it is not the topic of our uh, session. Um, what is important for the voter? We have a quite simple uh, system to vote. We have the, our ballot paper in have the such mood and uh, task to the voter is uh, to write uh, registration number of the candidate to the, the signed space of the ballot paper. It's very simple. Uh, and uh, electoral committee system is uh, national electoral committee send members uh, 17 county electoral committees and more than 600 polling station committees. One of the um, tasks of the national electoral committee is, uh, of course, the IT solution management and and. Uh, Time, time to time, time. It's more important task of the National Electoral Committee. This needs a special, uh, uh, special staff, and and uh, of course we have in the last years a lot of problems. And uh, I think that uh, um, important part of the uh, task of the National Electoral Committee is to solve this kind of the problems. And um, to, to close to the, um, to the topic, I, I want to um, give you a little overview about uh, types of voting. Of course, we have the, uh, the voting on election day. Our election day is the Sunday and advanced voting. And advanced voting takes place in Estonia, in foreign countries, and via internet in the in the whole West worldwide. Time of time of voting in Estonia is, um, um, as I said, the, internet, uh, the uh, uh, election day is the Sunday, and. Uh, uh, in the beginning of the so-called um, election week, uh, three days we have the polling division voting and uh, the internet voting take place uh, during the same day uh, 
uh, in the two week, during the two weeks uh, uh, in the before the election day. Uh, on election day, it's possible to vote in the polling station, and uh, we have the home voting. That means that uh, everyone who has the reason to this uh, have possibility to uh, to call the ballot box to their home in uh, advance voting in Estonia. There is a lot of possibilities. It's taken in the polling station of residents. Uh, in, in all municipalities, we have a one special uh, polling station. It's a possibility to vote outside of residence, and it is possible to vote in the place of location outside, uh, outside of residence. And this includes the prisons, social welfare houses, homes, hospice, hospitals, and, uh, and, and so on. For well, uh, paper voting outside of residence, we use the two envelope system, and this is the uh, outer envelope. This, uh, we have the data um, about the voters, the name, uh, code, and um, data of the uh, place of residence of the voter. Of course, we have the inner voter, which uh, include uh, the ballot paper. Uh, as I said, said we have the 20 years uh, uh, experience um, manage with the elections. In the 90s, we haven't. We have only um, possibility advance voting. Uh, in the uh, is as called home point station from the um, big, uh, 1999 we have the uh, possibility to vote uh, outside of the residence point station and um, in 19, uh, 2007 in uh, uh, parliamentary election 2005, in municipality election, we have the internet voting. And at the same time, the, uh, the uh, length of the voting time have been increased. It was three days advance voting. It's now it is the seven days period. In the 90s, we have, uh, in the foreign countries, we have possibility to vote only in the embassies and in uh, two place uh, uh, in the election day. Since 1999, we have possibility to vote um, uh, in the foreign countries in different modes, in the embassies, by post, and um, of course via internet. And uh, as I said, uh, internet voting first time in 2005, and uh, this is the development uh, is that the period of the uh, internet voting uh, increase from three days up to seven days. And uh, to, to conclude this, uh, this. Uh, overview about uh, voting modes I take some uh, some uh, some conclusion I think that uh, it is possible that in the 90s we have the post soviet uh, uh, period of the uh, uh, of the arrangement of elections uh, in the, from the end of the uh, last century 
up to first decade to the uh, to the end of the first decade of the 2000, maybe the score to the diversity of the voting modes, and uh, from the uh, end of the first decade, from the uh, 2000s, it's maybe the beginning of the year of the internet voting. As I, I, I try to point out that uh, in the end of this uh, conclusion is the question mark. We don't maybe exactly know it is the, which is the development because we have uh, only not too long period for the internet voting, but uh, you see that the period of voting and uh, uh, diversity of voting modes have been increased. But um, I think that uh, this is maybe only a hypothesis. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, see the figures. Turnout in Estonia in the parliament elections and was uh, higher in the beginning in the 90s. This is a lot of reasons. I think uh, this is not only the reason the uh, voting mode, but uh, uh, one, uh, of course, this is a reason of the uh, uh, voters register. One, one reason is the, uh, the situation in society. Of course, this is a lot of reasons. But uh, uh, statistically, uh, since 1999, the turnout in parliament election have been increased. To, to compare these uh, numbers with uh, local elections and elections to the European Parliament, we see that uh, it uh, jumping this number uh, took place during the last elections. And this is the increase of this number of the turnout was more than 10%. Uh, of course, this is a lot of other reasons than the voting modes, but uh, this is a fact. What is the directions in the, uh, uh, in the viewpoint of the um, voting modes. Yes, as I said, uh, uh, turnout has been increased. The second one, that uh, importance of the advanced voting increasing. Uh, and from the number of voters, this is uh, close to the 30% already but, and the uh, numbers who voted, it is more than 40 percent. It is a very big number. And uh, by this value, uh, we have the uh, very close position with uh, another Nordic countries. Uh, there is a difference. We have the, the Nordic countries have the period of advanced voting. Uh, two weeks, but we have less than uh, 10 days. Uh, the third direction is that the, uh, the importance of uh, advanced voting in police station, the traditional mode of the voting, decreasing. It was in 1999 uh, close to the 80, 90 percent, and it's only one third uh, uh, in the last parliamentary elections. Uh, the voting outside of residence, it is, of course, uh, uh, voting with a ballot paper. This number uh, forced them back. And uh, this increased during the 
period of diversity of protein folds. But now this is decreased. And the reason is, of course, that uh, as the reason to decreasing the, um, at the ballot paper voting during the advanced voting is the same, that the internet voting is uh, uh, share of the internet voting increase and this uh, de decrease these numbers. Both the ballot voting and uh, in the residential pol polling station and outside of the residence. Absolute numbers uh, is uh, uh, by this, mo this uh, mode of the voting is not uh, decreased so totally. And the last one, the importance of the internet voting uh, totally uh, increased. Uh, from the number of the voters, from number who voted, and from from number who voted at once, I think I think that uh, there are important, most important two figures. This figure that means that um, share or importance of the advance voting uh, already more than forty percent from this who voted, and uh, more than half of this voted via internet. And uh, these numbers are important for the, very important for the, of course, for the management of elections. That means that the traditional mode of the uh, traditional mode of the voting the share decreased. How to modify the election election management system in the future? How to situate uh, polling station? What kind of additional modes of voting use, how long this period must be. This is a lot of questions. And um, of course there is a question for the politicians, how to organize the campaigning. A lot of people voted already during the advanced voting period. Uh, I, I think that um, the, there is some battle between the traditional mode of voting and the internet voting uh, is in the beginning. We don't exactly know how, how is it in the future. How is this, what is the behavior of the voters? But um, I have uh, I know that our parliament and have a special working group to improve or to modify the of course the election management system and and we have a good time now we haven't uh, elections in this year and uh, in the next year. And uh, it is a uh, quite big task for the politicians and the uh, election management to, to improve and modify the, all, all the system to, in, in the face of such uh, Of course, we have a lot of more special speeches today about the internet voting and I hope that my some basics uh, is the background to the more detailed and uh, presentation. And thank you.
So, many thanks to Mr. Rava Heinzelo. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Mr. Brit Winkel, who is also a doctoral student and works as, at the Estonian Parliament and works also for the National Electoral Committee. Mr. Winkel has been involved in Estonian internet voting project since its beginning, and uh, he is the person to answer all questions about the security and reliability of Estonian internet voting system. And also, Mr. Winkel is uh, going to give us an overview of uh, recent developments of Estonian internet system. So, please. Thank you, Ulla. And hello, from my side too. And we are going to have a short look at the internet voting system as it is at the moment. Because, as Mr. Reynes has already said, that we are actually in the process of changing. There is a special select committee in the parliament that is actually meeting every week already and, and discussing all the different um, possibilities to improve the system, to improve the security openness and, uh, and, the, and discuss all the, the, um, the uh, propositions that have, have, made, have been made in the, uh, bef uh, before and after the last elections in March. So, we just have a short look at the actual system of internet voting. So, since 2005, we have had five elections. It started all in local elections, well, twice now in local elections, twice in parliamentary elections, and once in European Parliament elections. As you see, the green line of internet voters has skyrocketed actually from the very beginning, from 10,000 to 140,000 in this year's general elections. So this has been a very steep rise there. But if you look at the overall turnout, then we cannot see a kind of a linear um, uh, rise there too. So we will come to the issue of turnout later, of course. But uh, and as you can see here, these two lines are somewhat different here. I think all of these figures here about E-Estonia that can be found here in this room, actually, in this uh, improved demo center, and uh, have been already discussed earlier already. Maybe one of the most important uh, figures here that the electronic identity has been almost delivered to all uh, Estonians in, in Estonia. So we, we can speak uh, of a very good spread of electronic identity that's uh, like at the backbone of the internet working system we are using. The ID card project, and as we say, though, the electronic, uh, uh, electronic identity is the backbone uh, of the system, and uh, we have a, actually a completed rollout or a full rollout of, of all ID cards. This is also, I think, familiar to you. I'll just uh, skip this, but it's really important that we have such a possibility. And I think also mobile ID has been already introduced to you and also can be found here on, on these information stands and, and, and maybe we can have a look at this one. Both ID card and mobile ID can be used to vote over the internet in Australia. So, what were the reasoning or what were the reasons actually behind internet voting in the very beginning? I'm, I'm just talking about 2002, when, when, when actually the idea came, uh, and actually one of the most important uh, uh, reasons was to provide a new convenient channel of voting, and thereby improving voting activity. So when you're talk, talking about turnout, we are not talking so much of increasing turnout, but mainly to keep the already there turnout, to keep these younger people who maybe won't go to the poll station, or they don't go uh, or, or use any other possibilities to bring those younger people to vote or keep those who have maybe voted once but don't want to go another, another time because it's maybe inconvenient for them. Maybe a second important reason was to create an essential convenience in information society. Somewhat an, an difficult sentence here, but, but still, the idea is that Internet voting is just another EID service that can be used by using the ID card. 
it's nothing too different from, for example, using the ID card logging into banks or using the ID card for declaring their taxes, for example. It's nothing too different. And the political realism, especially in the beginning wars, we have to state it, and we like it or not, but maybe those parties who actually uh, were the forefathers uh, of this idea thought it would increase their some of uh, their mm, supporters or the number of their supporters and maybe uh, maybe uh, be a little bit uh, mm, have an influence on, on their political opponents. Um, this was the idea from the very beginning but what we know now that when scientifically speaking internet voting is politically neutral. So this idea that maybe was in the beginning is not backed up in the scientific research. A brief prehistory here to see the idea actually came in 2001 and then the 2001 and already in 2002 there was a very, uh, very small part of the uh, basis of any sort of was set in the law. Uh, it, it, it was very um, uh, universal uh, setting there and nothing too detailed and the detailed um, uh, legal basis was set uh, just before the 2005 elections, before the municipal elections. So we had the legal basis, or the legal principle, already in 2002, and then for three years we had time to develop the system. And that's always what we say to other countries who come to Estonia and want to have some kind of ideas how to start in their country. And we always say, start with the legal basis, and then go on to the technical uh, side of because that way you have some of, of, of a good background when, when, when you're doing that. But because when you have already a technical solution and try to build the legal solution around this technical solution, you might not end in, 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 in a dead end, and in a practical dead end, so to say. So we had a special project team, a project manager chosen already in 2003, and all kinds of concepts uh, were, were built there, and then uh, via public procurement, uh, Cybernetica, the company, was chosen, who is our, uh, our private partner in, 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 in the development of internet voting. So, the green issue of trust, uh, the issue of trust has been said so much already uh, here during these three days that uh, I cannot say it enough. But trust in, in all kinds of uh, information systems, or ICT systems, is the crucial idea actually you have to have. And trust is what we have to build all, all, all uh, throughout the, the, the uh, time of our uh, interfering. You can have the token, you can have the, the law behind you, but if the voters do not trust your system, then most likely you will not succeed. Well, the main principles of, of internet voting Maybe many of them are already known to you, but let's say it all, all together. The all major principles of paper voting are and should be followed. That the voter has uh, the confidence of using this uh, possibility that it is all done the same way as on paper. So we try to um, some, somehow modify these principles, but still use the same principles as we use on paper voting. It is allowed during seven days, or at least it, it has been allowed for the last two elections. It was for three days before uh, in, in, in uh, three elections. The user, user can use either ID card or mobile ID, or also there's a third possibility if, for example, the ID card is lost or somehow it's not possible to use the ID card and you don't have a mobile ID, you can get uh, um, kind of a blank card or the EID card without your, uh, your physical uh, data on the chip. For example, you don't have a, uh, your um, picture on it, you just have it for your digital identity. And when, for example, you get an ID card in seven days, this uh, EID, I think you can get on the same day. So if you need only your EID identity, you can get it for a lot of uh, uh, quicker time and as your normal ID card. Repeated internet voting is allowed and then the last internet ballot is counted. It's really important 
Uh, as Ulla already said in the very beginning, that repeated internet voting is also one of the really important ideas to guarantee anonymity and secrecy of the vote and freedom of the vote. Manual revoting is also allowed. That means if you don't trust the internet voting system at all, maybe after some time, you can go to the police station during advanced voting days and give a new paper ballot, and then your paper ballot counts and your ancient vote is being cancelled. And this cancellation of votes is quickly drawn up here. It's quite a uh, difficult system at the moment, but we have some plans of improving, uh, of using electronic voters' lists or voter roll, and that makes it a lot easier for the cancellation of votes, so it won't stop here for too long. Best registration in Estonia is actually missing because everybody in Estonia uh, has to be in, uh, in the uh, population register. And the, and the votes are all, or the votes lists are actually takeouts of the population register. So we have uh, kind of a um, uh, big part missing that actually is, uh, uh, is in many cases the step uh, stone for, for, for many countries who, who, who cannot introduce the system because of the uh, population register system that this is not um, compa comparable or compatible with, with, with a, the idea of internet voting. But in Estonia, that's uh, all done by using the population register. And uh, then we just take out the, the voters from there and it's done electronically. As I told you before, that we have to have all the same procedures and principles that a paper voter would have, and so we we, we also have this, this, uh, the exact same system uh, that's on paper, the dual envelope system that Mr. Haynes already showed you, the auto envelope, the same system is also being used electronically. So a public-private key system is used, PKE uh, system is used for encryption, and then the uh, vote is encrypted, that's kind of the blank or inner envelope, the digital signature is uh, the layer is put around the encrypted vote, and then this um, vote is being kept in the, in the system. And just before uh, opening the votes or telling the votes, the outer layer is separated from the inner layer, so at no point nobody knows how a person voted. And then the votes are decrypted and the results are tabulated. So the same envelope system actually used on paper is also used electronically. The architecture of the infant voting system is also uh, quite simple, actually, that we have only one server held on, totally online, that's the vote forwarding server. So the vote application that's being downloaded from our web page communicates only with the vote forwarding server, and the only task of the vote forwarding server is to forward the votes to the vote storing server behind all, all kinds of uh, security equipment. Uh, so this is the, uh, the way of, of minimizing the risks that uh, if somebody tries to hack into the vote forwarding server, then, then all the votes have already been transferred to the vote storing server already. And we come to the vote the application but later, but uh, here to be safe that uh, in Estonia we use a separate vote application. It, it is not integrated uh, in, in, in the in the, um, in the um, browser or, or, or a kind of other means, it is a separate program, separate application, you just download an exe file, for example, for Windows, or for Linux or Macintosh, uh, the, the uh, bigger platforms are, are being supported. So, also quite interesting for you, well, I haven't seen the actually uh, actual process of voting, is the user view, of uh, how the user view of the instant voting. So, the user goes to the website for voting, volumes.t, elections.t, and then download and run, uh, and run the voting application, as you can see. The, 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 this is done in Windows, download the virtual application for, for Windows. And then when you start the application, you, you, know, you have to choose if you use ID card or a mobile ID for your uh, secure identification. Let's say you chose ID card, then you put your card in the card reader and set pin 1 for, uh, for your authentication, for this code, and you are uh, authenticated. 
in case your mobile ID, you enter your phone number in the uh, next screen, you'll get a verification code sent to your mobile phone. You will look, look at the screen if, if the code seen on the screen is the same as sent on your mobile phone and then enter the, the pin 1 in the mobile phone, the same actually as in, in ID cards. So you are identified, your name, your personal code is being presented and then you said welcome to voting. So here we see parliamentary elections, uh, PR elections, uh, many parties and uh, there are long party list lists and uh, when in normal elections you just have to write the three digit or in some cases also four digit code uh, before the name of the candidate to the appropriate place on the ballot paper and here you just have to click. Click on the name of the, uh, uh, of the candidate you just want to give your vote to. And after that you have to um, confirm a choice by giving a digital signature. For that the PIN 2 is used, a five digit code, an ID card is quite simple. You have a new, uh, new window coming up and in mobile ID the same as PIN 2. You have a verification code and then you insert the PIN 2 into your mobile phone and that's it. The vote has been received. So easy as that. And as, as you saw, uh, there are two steps as the same as in paper voting. You go to the polling station, you give your ID to the voting officer, the voting officer identifies, uh, identifies you and then uh, you give a signature to the voting uh, polling roll that you have received the, um, uh, the uh, voting materials. Here you are being authenticated by uh, the first step and then you, after you sign your decision, it's kind of the same as done on paper. So the same idea as on paper. The technology selection for our system is as simple as possible. Everything is uh, without any bells and whistles. Everything is uh, quite lean and, and modern. Uh, we only use widely known programming languages and no fancy user interfaces. Also for server operations, we have a black screen with, with white, white characters on, on it. And, uh, that's it. No graphics at all. Managing procedures also are fully documented, uh, a special crash course for example for servers. The political observers or and auditors are, uh, is being held just before the elections because observing internet voting is totally different than observing any other ways of voting. So we have to have some kinds of crash course to bring them up to date what they are about to see. And also all security critical procedure logged, audited, observed and also videotaped. So everything is the procedure is on a very strict uh, surveillance. And the hosting and monitoring is also done by the government. We have security hosting provided by the government, uh, very strict requirements for server premises, for example. And also all hardware and data carriers are uh, very particularly sealed and, and uh, there are a lot specialists involved in network monitoring, for example, during these seven days, actually 24 hours. Uh, somebody is monitoring the Estonian mm, network, or actually, we can't say it's Estonian, but I'm actually monitoring the network around us for any threats or uh, uh, possible attacks on the system. So, some statistics also. It's done for young people. I think the uh, question of age is, is also an issue that's coming up in, in, in the next, uh, next hour, but here, here are the the actual results uh, based on the actual voters, you can see it's not only for young people, also the, the number of people over 55, for example, is, is quite high. Yeah, uh, so we can see the, um, mm, yes, still the uh, date in the age group of 25 to uh, 34 is the, 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 the largest, but, and then and the peak of, of users is somewhere between 28 and 29. Um, this is the age. The, the most interventors are still there's also a lot of people voting or over 55 years of age and it's only for curious men yes in the beginning uh, as you saw earlier Mr. Ainsley showed you that, that there are more uh, female uh, voters than uh, electorate is, is 
uh, that are more more female than, than men. And in, in the beginning, male were maybe more adventurous, took took the the new idea a little bit more more to the heart. But now nowadays, in, in, in this year's elections, really it has it has come the other way around. So, it was also a really important aspect of ancient Britain is that it doesn't know any borders. Uh, we have the possibility of the uh, has the possibility to vote everywhere he or she is staying. So as you can see, two people in Afghanistan have the possibility to vote. When they, and so also the Arabia contain 105 countries all over the world used, or, or people staying in, in 105 countries all over the world use the possibility to vote over the internet. So of course Finland uh, or uh, over the bay neighbor is if the uh, has the largest number, but still there are some very exotic countries here too. As may be said also before, that uh, interfering has also had some kind of impact on um, mm, on the usage of ID card or using ID card electronically. As you can see here, these red dots are actually elections or the. Uh, the time of elections, so you can see, and this blue line here is, uh, is the growth of people who, who have uh, uh, used their uh, ID card electronically. Of course, it's possible to use the ID card also only manually. Or traveling within the European Union is totally possible just by showing uh, this to the, to the customs officer. Uh, but here, this red line is the total number of, of, of all people who have used. Uh, ID card, their ID card electronically, so just over 400,000, so just a little bit under and under half of all the people who have an ID card have used it electronically. Uh, but all people have it, so it's just their, their possibility to choose whether they use it or not. And these peaks here show that the elections uh, have been some, somewhat of, um, of uh, motivators for those people to, to use use the ID cards electronically, maybe for the first time we look at it, yes. And as you can see here, in 2005, uh, 61% actually used the ID card for the first time to vote. So this, this has been uh, an ongoing process, actually, and this was also tackled in one of the papers presented uh, in, uh, in Monday, I think. The fact of trust is crucial, also an uh, important lesson for us, already said before, the existence of a country with electronic authentication system is vital. That has been a problem in, in many countries who want to have an ID, a, a internet voting system, but they actually have a problem with with their authentication or secure authentication over the internet. That internet voting is a part of the concept of the government. Really, really important. It's not a standalone uh, standalone solution. It is and should be a um, a strong part of the, of the concept of the government, and that is as safe or even a little bit safer and normal as internet banking, but it should be actually people because if you trust your your money to uh, the long lines of internet, then you as might use uh, use the same for for voting too. Of course, there's a lot of discussions about these these possible uh, these um, issues here, but, but still, uh, it is safe, we can say. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you, Pete. Uh, the next presentation comes from the European University Institute. Professor Alexander Drexel has uh, been in lead of the scientific research of Estonian internet voters since 2005. Uh, he and his uh, research team have um, performed some uh, surveys in order to clarify why internet voters have chosen internet uh, from all the voting channels and has brought out uh, very interesting results. Another people in the presentation is Mr. Christian Weissel. Uh, he's a doctoral student of uh, Professor Drexel and actually the doctoral thesis is ready already. And uh, Christian is in Estonia a quite well-known scientist on this field, field and I think that uh, you two together can give, give us some very interesting, hot and controversial information. So, the floor is yours. OK. 
Okay, uh, let me see how that works. Can we get the slides on? Uh, should we vasil.ppt? I think. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about one particular aspect of instrument coding, and perhaps one of the most intriguing one, as we have seen from, from the slides that Preet showed. Um, over time, what we see is an increasing number of, of, uh, of internet voters. But what we don't see is a concomitant effect on the turnout. The turnout level remains the same. So the intriguing question what we have posed in our research is, is, is why e-voting fails to boost turnout, although it is you know, one of the basic premises or, or, or expectations why governments uh, want to implement e-voting in the first place. Surely enough, there are all sorts of other reasons why we, why we like e-voting and pre-explicated them uh, uh, convincingly so, like providing a more convenient uh, channel, keeping turnout from going down instead of maybe uh, in growth. It, nevertheless, the question why e-voting fails to boost turnout remains an interesting puzzle. So um, let me address um, a few issues with, within that uh, topic. Now let me start off with, uh, um, with a basic question for which I think we have a pretty solid understanding. First, who are the internet voters to begin with? And if we look at the theory, and if we look at the um, previous empirical findings, uh, then they tend to be young uh, people who are highly educated. They, they, they have a high socioeconomic status. They mostly come from, from urban areas. And most importantly, they are those who are politically already involved. In other words, they are regular voters. So this is indeed what we do see in the descriptive statistics that Preet showed, this is something that we see across the wide, the, the, the wide uh, field of internet voting studies. Sorry, that was a bit rapid. What happened in the team? Okay. So, so much about um, the, the usage of, uh, of internet voting. What we really don't know that much or that well is its impact. And impact, what do we mean by impact? We mean by impact e-voting's capacity to mobilize new voters, to bring those who are disengaged from politics closer to politics and subsequently vote uh, at elections. And if, if e-voting, I mean, that is the basic theoretical and also an empirical explanation to, um, to uh, the capacity of internet uh, voting to mobilize new voters is that if there are any mobilization effects at all, then they occur among those who are young, who are basically though the same people who use it. Because after all, it is the young who are exposed to the new media at much higher rates than any other social demographic groups. These are the people who, uh, who use ICTs most intensively. And as Preet also showed, among the very, and as we know from the turn of literature and comparative turn of literature, as the turn of levels remain very low among precisely the, those uh, from the age group of 18, 19, 20, the very young, then if internet voting has any mobilizing capacity, then it should exactly occur among the young and those who would be the typical e-voters to begin with. I mean, other than their regular voters, they should be exactly what we see on the, on the screen here. This approach, however, implies that we equate usage of internet voting with its impact. And indeed, believe me, I've done, I've done my part of the research on that. If you look at the literature, then you don't find, and if you do, please point, point out this to me, you don't find an account an applied analytical account that tackles usage as a distinct notion and concept uh, from impact. 
And I think this is fundamentally important to decompose these two phenomena. Because, for example, imagine a user, um, an in, a typical internet user, uh, from living in central Tallinn, say his a young male, highly educated, just completed his master's degree, um, earning a good deal of money, and he's a regular voter. But, and he has like, you know, a smartphone in his pocket, he's a heavy internet uh, 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 user, et cetera, et cetera. So for him, the technology is so deep-rooted in his everyday practices that he barely even notices when he, you know, uses internet voting or any other internet application for that matter. But say, if now internet voting comes along, then, you know, if it works conveniently, he might feel some sort of an impact. You know, it's not really mobilization, but there is an impact. He would say, well, it wasn't convenient, it was raining outside on that Sunday. Well, actually, it's an advance. Let's say, you know, it's raining, and he can, he can do his duty, civic duty, and he votes, and there is, you know, if one could operationalize and measure impact, then there is some sort of an impact. And now imagine another voter, an elderly man from south of Estonia, the only technology that he has is, is his TV set in the fridge. But for some reason, so, you know, technology is really not in his, you know, embedded in his life. But for some reason, his son brings along an old laptop, shows him around a bit of internet, you know, he kind of, you know, gets into, into using it. And his son assists him, say, in, in, in the voting procedure. For him, he would not probably have voted had not his son shown him how to do it, and you know, the technology basically came to his own. So we're still not talking about the impact, but th this is, you know, hugely different. The impact is hugely different from that of the, of the chap living in Tallinn. So I think we need to really distinguish what is usage and what is impact. And it is a bit of a surprise to me that it's not done up until now. Now the tricky question is how do we measure that? How do we operationalize that? Because being an empiricist, this is the key question, you know. The first thing I think is pretty straightforward. We run surveys asking people whether, which, which, in which way did you participate in the elections. So we know we can distinguish normal voters from e-voters and from those abstaining from elections. The way we have gone about impact is, is asking the following question. If you didn't have the possibility to vote online, would you still have voted? And I know many social scientists, many political scientists, do not like self-reflexive behavioral assessments. And I'm the first one who doesn't like them. But this is what we have to live with at the moment, because addressing an impact in a cross-sectional survey type of research is difficult. And this is, up until now, what we, what we, what we have and what we can work with. Um, at least of all, of course, you can, you can imagine that this kind of captures still some sort of a self-perceived impact measure, something like that, that goes in the, in, along the line of the impact that we actually do want to measure. So now that we have that empirical model set up, let's see how we can apply this into the recent data that we have gathered during 2011 March elections and see, see how, how, um, how usage and impact actually work. So let me say a word about the data. So since 2005, now it is five consecutive elections that, for which we have, we've had e-voting available, we have sampled a, a sample of, of people according to the types of voters, that is traditional voters, e-voters, and non-voters. And we've sampled them because in 2005 we only had less than 10,000 e-voters and on a random probability sample we would end up having, you know, two or three e-voters in our sample. So what we did with the help of the National Electoral Study, we managed to, to, to select the groups of people that we needed and roughly we sampled one-third of each of these groups. So we have the data going back all the way to 2005. Now next, what, what I'm going to walk you through is a basic regression analysis, but I'm not going to bother you with all sorts of statistical elements, so, so just bear with me for a moment. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to show you is, 
I'm going to show you how these characteristics that we talked beforehand are associated, or in statistical terms, predict e-voting, while traditional voters are the reference category. So we have a dichotomous, what we call a dependent variable, showing the, uh, the e-voters. And then on the second step, we focus only on the sample of e-voters, and we look at the impact, because the impact can only occur, we can assess the impact only among those who actually did use e-voting. So what explains usage and what explains impact? So this is a simple way how to show you the regression, the multivariate uh, uh, analysis, uh, the regression results. So the dependent variable here is usage. And those uh, characteristics that are larger explain internet moving uh, better, and those uh, that are smaller explain it less effectively, are less are, are associated not so strongly with um, internet voting. So as you see, education and the trust to our ICTs in general and the voting uh, system in particular are by far the highest uh, predictors. Estonian language remains remains a good predictor of, of internet voting. High income, past uh, participation, the regular voters, etc., etc. Now, I think there is still too much, you know, to continue to assess the impact. There is still too much details. These are very fine-grained results, and 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 with the help of the of the factor analysis, I would propose to reduce. I mean, factor analysis is a data reduction technique that we can use to to tease out a single latent dimension or a trait that would in a way characterize the covariance of these these characteristics it's not it's not uh, uh, really uh, difficult to understand because if you look at those characteristics then i think it, it should be pretty reasonable to find a common denominator for them and i call that e citizenship well that's can be argued you know but but this is this is this is how how we have gone about it now imagine that this e-citizenship, in a way, is a scale ranging from zero to one, with having you know a number of uh, of um, intermediate steps in uh, in there, and you can basically place every individual in our survey along this line, saying how much are you e-citizen in a way. So the chap that we talked about previously that lived in Tallinn with smartphones and all the gadget, he isn't one and the guy in southern Estonia scores zero, or close to zero. So you get an idea. Now the question is how that e-citizenship is associated with usage and how it is uh, associated with impact. And this is my final slide, and, and I'm not going to bother you more about statistics. But just imagine that there is a probability of an event on a y-axis ranging from zero to one, and say if there is a probability of you can imagine the probability of 0.5. Somebody says that there is a chance of rain tomorrow at the probability of 0.5. You would take your umbrella with you. So that's kind of a threshold. And on the x-axis, we have an e-citizenship. Now, first, let's look at how usage works. And if we now put all these controls into the econometric model and we, we estimate that probability, what we see is that the e as e-citizenship increases, the probability of Internet usage also increases. There's no news. We know that very well from the literature. No big news here. Now, about the impact, if the theory is right, and if the previous empirical accounts are right, those that equate usage with impact, this should, we should see exactly the same pattern, or maybe the steeper or something like that. In fact, if we plot impact, we see an inverse. And I think that's a hugely important finding that has been, in a way, overlooked. And because we have failed to detect the segment at which internet voting um, exercises an impact, and that is those who are peripheral in political sense, if you like, the elderly people, um, less education, um, lower income, this is the group where 
where the impact of e voting is the highest. But then again, the chances that they ever come across to e voting are also the lowest possible, close to zero. So the question, the policy implication for, from what, what to take away from here is not to focus on the young, because they will learn their ways, you know, from traditional means, from whatever means. The policy implication is that one has to focus on those who are peripheral in political sense. And that's a bit counterintuitive, but this is what we... And the question, of course, arises, well, a political science scientist presenting a survey, you know, what's the credibility of that? We see that in each and every wave of the study that we have done in Estonia over five elections. We have seen that in a different set of data that we have used in 2007, completely different data, and in the national probability sample. And we have used that, uh, we have seen that the similar pattern also in the usage of voting advice applications. So there is some universality into this, which I think is really, really important to recognize. And finally, I think this also provides an answer why we don't see an aggregate uh, change in turnout, because in a way it cancels out. There is a small impact on a small segment, but just very small. There is no way how e-voting can change that, at least at the moment. Whether this remains so or not, this is the question for the future. But I think this works as the best solution that we have now for, for the explanation of the question, why e-voting fails to boost turnout. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Trixen has announced that he will uh, take part in the panel discussion later. And so the time is to, to ask uh, Mr. Robert Kramer to take the floor and uh, to give a brief overview of these recommendations OSCE has given to Estonia. And maybe you can give some brief overview of internet voting and e-voting in the world in general, if you can. But of course, we can do it later also. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ulle. Thank you also my uh, co-presenters before, I know uh, Britt and Christian and Alex sitting in the audience. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in Estonia and talk about internet voting because there is this educated uh, population here and also everybody having experience, so you don't really have to start from scratch. However, I'm now in a bit of a different capacity here. I'm here to um, deliver you something that... Um, is quite well known from paper-based elections, but is not that frequently used for electronic elections or electronically supported elections, which is called election observation. And election observation as such is a, a topic that has emerged over the past 50 years and more increasingly so since the fall uh, or since the post-Soviet area. And uh, as such, I will give you a short view of who we are I'm working for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and its Office for uh, Democratic Instruments and Human Rights. And we have been founded in 1990, originally as the Office for Free Elections, and this gives you already a very clear picture of what we are doing in the election department. We're trying to support the move towards free election to regularly held elections. And we have about 150 staff members, of which about 15 are working on elections. All the others are working on non-tolerance, on, uh, on, on tolerance and non-discrimination, sorry for that, on human rights and on democratization. We have a budget of about 16 million, um, with even 4 million extra budgetary uh, contributions. Uh, we are very international, so we have even 30 uh, OSC participating states uh, that have sent us uh, employees or that we have hired. We have a network of about 2,000 international experts. We deploy about 3,500 experts around the OSC area to elections a year. We've done more than 200 election observation missions in the past 20 years. And we do about 15 to, as last year, 21 election observation missions. And we thought that this year is going to be a very light year. We're going to have very few missions. And actually, it turns out we have more than ever. But well, that seems to be our fate. So what is election observation? 
Election observation is there to assess compliance of an electoral process with international standards, with, and especially in the field of uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, with self-set standards by its participating states. So all 56 participating states have come to an agreement back in 1990 what free elections are. In the end, we want to create confidence amongst voters, amongst contestants, and overall in the uh, electoral process. We want to enhance the integrity of the process. We want to deter possible fraud and intimidation by just being there. That's usually what works quite well. We're process-oriented. We don't care about the results as long as they're uh, established in a, in a meaningful manner. And, and that is the core of our business, we try to recommend ways in which the elections can be improved. So you can think of election observation as, as, a, as a thing of a peer review of other participating states looking at the electoral process of one state and giving feedback to the election organized how to do better. So it's not something where you say, oh, it's good or it's bad. No, it's something where you try to develop together with the observed country. And that also brings you right to the beginning. An election observation has one important precondition. You're invited by the host country. And that is actually something that we have been by the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs last year. Let me come to this new challenge to election observation, because what we all know is when we touch paper, we can feel it, we can see it. When we talk about electronic voting, about new voting technologies as kind of like this big broad term, we have the problem that we can't see the actual vote. So we have to look at the overall framework, we have to look at the technical procedures, we have to look at technical measures, how to guarantee and how to observe these elections or to overall assess them. By new voting technologies, we do mean the use of ICT in the electoral process in terms of casting the vote, counting the vote, and tabulating the votes. It's a bit broader than the Council of Europe definition and its recommendation from 2004, which only limits uh, electronic voting to actually using electronic means in casting the vote. So we are a bit broader, so we also include optical scanners, we include also election management systems that are used in that respect. Um, as, you, as, as I refer to that election observation is kind of like the assessment whether or not an election is in line with international standards, what are the standards in the area of new voting technologies? And the most commonly known standard is something that is not very surprising. It is actually the standard that we use for general elections. This, this is the Copenhagen 1990 commitments that all participating states have committed themselves to. So whatever is valid for paper-based elections, also has to be valid for electronic elections. There is no difference, so to speak. However, it's clear that those uh, commitments cannot be transferred one-to-one -to, -one to an electronic election. You have to use maybe different means, you have to adapt the methodology how to observe that, and that's what we're doing right now. One first step was the Council of Europe recommendation from 2004, where they defined a set of over 100 points where to look at in the legal area, in the technical area, but also in the operational area. And they have been updated recently with two guidelines on certification and transparency. And that's kind of like the core set that we have right now. While it's not binding to all of the OSC participating states, especially when we talk about Council of Europe recommendations, they're not legally binding. It's only politically binding documents. So we use that as as the basis for our feedback process. So how did we organize, or how did we come to this conclusion to uh, observe or to assess, which is the better word, uh, the elections in March of this year in Estonia? First of all, all participating states of the OEC have a withstanding invitation to the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights to invite them for uh, observing elections. But this is always expressed in a special letter and that we received on the 9th of December of last year when the MFA told us, please come and observe the parliamentary elections to the Rigi Kogo 
in Estonia. But in our, based on our methodology, we deploy a needs assessment mission where a small team of three persons, in our case it was Armin Radic, our senior election advisor, Alexander Schlick, who is the desk officer for Estonia in our office, and myself came to Estonia. We assessed the pre-electoral environment and we looked if there is, when, by talking to interlocutors, some of them sit here in this room, uh, helped us decide is there something that such an election activity of our office can contribute to the electoral process. And um, we decided that because of the issues that we found, free elections are not really in danger in Estonia, but rather there are certain points of focus that are of interest. And so we decided not to deploy a full election observation mission, but to deploy an election assessment mission. The big difference is we don't have big numbers of observers that go to every polling station, but we have a set of small, a, a small team of experts that are dedicated to certain areas, like, for example, new voting technologies. And so we had 13 analysts in the country for a bit over a month, at least parts of them, especially the uh, new voting technologies experts that came from 14 participating states of the OSC. They were in the country from basically 7th of February till the 8th of March of this year, and then also returned for a post visit on the 11th of April where data was destroyed. And following our methodology, we released a public report about two months after the last election activity in the country, which we did on the 16th of May. And actually, I have a copy of the report here with me, but you all can download it from our webpage, uh, which is www.odir.pl slash elections, and then you just click on Estonia. And uh, so here also you can see the cover page. And um, in this report, which is about 28 pages long, we try to look at several areas of concern. And let me first uh, cite this one uh, basically summary that we did for the electoral internet process. The OECD election assessment mission in general widespread trust in the conduct of internet voting. So we did not find any major, I would say, where and our interlocutors were seeing problems with the internet voting process. However, we found scope for further improvement of the legal framework, of the oversight and accountability, and technical aspects of internet voting. But please let me say, this is not something where Estonia has failed in something, but where we see that Estonia could improve and even do better than they already did. So please understand the ways that we uh, that I cite the recommendations now in this in this meaning. So let me come to the legal framework. In the legal framework, we recommend that uh, all stages of the internet voting, including the conditions for inval invalidation of internet voting results, are very detailed in the law. So it should be more clear for the average user how the internet voting process is organized already on the basis of the law, similar to how it's done for paper-based elections. Also, uh, we recommend that in the legal basis, consideration is given to the data destruction process of personal data, which you have in elections, in a way that this is uh, clarified in the law how this is done, in line with the Personal Data Protection Act, which also means that people know how this personal data is processed throughout the uh, election. And one thing that basically was a big surprise to pretty much everyone was that during the election process, or actually during the counting, uh, an invalid vote was detected. And basically, it there is going to be a paper in tomorrow's academic conference, Vote ID, that is trying to explain the reasons for that a bit more in detail. But we found that the legal basis has no uh, regulation on how to declare an internet vote invalid. So we thought that that should be made more clear in the law. In terms of management and oversight, as well as accountability, we have recommended that the election 
commission is upgrading its internal IT expertise and capabilities in terms of internet voting. If you so speak by modern terminology, insource internet voting into the election commission and retain detailed written records of all stages of the internet voting. Only because it's an electronic process doesn't mean you don't have to keep records. And so you should have written records throughout uh, the process, keeping minutes of all meetings, etc. In a similar line, we recommended that the National Election Commission issues formal reports on the testing of the internet voting and publish them on the website accessible for everyone, which could then, in the end, enhance transparency and verifiability of the process. A third recommendation in this area was also to formalize a disaster recovery plan, which you usually have for big internet uh, applications. So you should have a plan what you do when something happens, and not only in your head, but also in a written format, because when there is a problem, there is no time to do that, which might be also the thing that at the beginning when you start something, you don't have the time to do that, but now with this increased popularity of the internet world, that's something where you have to raise the standards even more because also of the special responsibility that Estonia has being the first country to do that. Um, in terms of transparency, uh, we recommended to delegating the responsibility of certifying and certifying meaning to ensure that the system is going to perform as planned. So to have a certain sincerity of how the system will function to an independent public body that would evaluate, digitally sign the final piece of software that is going to be used and then publish a public evaluation report. Similarly, and what we actually liked very much, was that there was an operation manual available on the internet, on the website, accessible for every voter, that they could see how actually the election process is organized, but it was not in sequence of the steps taken to organize the voting process, so it's sometimes a bit difficult to follow. So we propose to consolidate this operation manual to one single document. And similarly, this document would then be used by a public body independent that performs a compliance audit. And here it's important for us that it's a public body and not a private company in this respect that would use this consolidated operation manual to check how the internet voting is conducted. In terms of security, we recommended that there, were, that there are going to be formal software deployment rules. So how the software is actually used and which version actually is used. So ideally, you would have the election commission saying, okay, this is now going to be the software we're using for the election at a certain deadline before the voting process starts. Also, due to the nature of how elections are organized, especially in the Scandinavian area, you need to update the voter lists. And uh, Due to this updating, there is the need for a maintenance of the internet voting service, which we think should be avoided. So we recommend that there is no maintenance done on the internet voting service during the election period, during the voting period when the internet voting is active. And one thing that we already have heard today, uh, from, uh, yeah, heard today, that, that something like this is happening. OCOD is recommending that an inclusive working group is installed to consider ways of, uh, of introducing a verifiable internet voting scheme or equally reliable mechanism. So we're not saying that it has to be something specific, but something that allows the voter to check whether or not his or her vote was changed by malicious software. Reason for that was also a case that turned up during the observation where someone was claiming that this would be possible. And finally, but not the last recommendation in terms of electronic voting or internet voting, is also observation. We liked very much the fact that there is an observation training program, but we think here it could be even done better 
in allowing observers in the whole process to take part and to intensify the training uh, offerings and the materials offered to uh, the voters, but also political parties, to take part in this organization process. So it's not an isolated effort of some technicians, but also of the voters or the electorate itself. One last recommendation, which I don't have on my slides because they only slightly touch on, on internet voting, is also the fact that the application is only available in Estonian and not in languages of national minorities. And here we also have a recommendation and a report that something which is very easy for an electronic process should also be used in an internet voting process to offer it in languages other than Estonian. Let me come to the conclusions. Estonia is the only country to date, and actually only for one more month, that is offering internet voting in general elections. Switzerland will be the next country to join Estonia, although on a much smaller scale, they will only allow internet voters from abroad in their federal national elections. We can say that internet voting is increasingly popular in Estonia. And it was the second time for the OSCODIR to assess such an internet voting process. And this helps us also to refine our methodology. We see that there is scope for improvement to make it better than it is already. Because we think that Estonia has this special role, as I mentioned before. Many countries come here, and this conference is the best example for that, to see how Estonia is doing the things. So actually, we think that Estonia can even do better than they already did. And OECD will come back to Estonia later this fall to formally deliver the final report and discuss it with the authorities on possibilities on cooperation, how to implement them, or to see where uh, possibilities for a follow-up are. But we'll come for that later. Thank you. So, thank you, Robert. And uh, now we have 23 minutes left for panel discussion. And so, I would like to ask all panelists to take the seat. Uh, I hope we have some assistance here, someone who could uh, give to the audience the microphone. Yes, you have your own. Okay, very good. You can use this microphone there. And if I may, I would start by asking Alex, uh, does internet voting give any advance to young and well-doing people? And why I am asking that is that uh, in all results of your service, you have concluded that actually in the usage of the internet voting, there is no difference between uh, male and female voters, between urban and rural voters, uh, between educated and not so well educated peoples. The fact what is de determining whether or not a voter uses internet as a voting channel is actually the computing skills. And of course, computing skills have mainly these uh, more educated people. And so the question is, uh, does internet voting give any advance, advantage to well-doing, well-educated, rich people? Say directly, you please. I give mine and I switch on another one. Yes. Oh, technology. Test, test. Okay. So, so let me say this once again. Um, all depends on what you mean by advantage. It, it, of course, is advantages to them in the sense that they are, uh, uh, they will easily understand how it works, and therefore they have one more uh, channel of voting at their disposal. And as we know, for the moment, uh, uh, internet voting offers in Estonia certainly the most flexible way of casting a vote. First of all, you can take your vote for a period of seven days. 
Um, and secondly, you can change your vote if you want to. The other forms of voting in Estonia do not allow people to do that. So, uh, if you are an internet voter, you have a certain advantage in this in this sense. Uh, that's true. Uh, but could you comment your results of the previous studies, where you uh, concluded that uh, actually there is no difference between male and female voters, etc.? Well, uh, yeah, we have to be we have to nuance this a little bit. If you look. Um, at the simple distribution of internet voters and non-voters, uh, traditional voters, uh, along gender divisions or along age uh, categories, you will find differences. But as, as soon as you, uh, as we say in, uh, uh, in statistical terms, as soon as you control for other factors, and among those are, are ICT liter you know, literacy and, uh, and, uh, and trust in the system, if you remember the uh, slides that uh, uh, Christian has shown, these have the biggest uh, fonts uh, and therefore the biggest impact in the explanation of why people actually do use the internet uh, to vote or not. So as, as soon as you take into consideration these factors, you will see that demographics and social uh, demographic factors uh, very strongly lose their, their power, their explanatory power. Thank you. But uh, now I would like to ask whether someone has to to ask something from our good speakers, or or has someone? Oh, good. Please. Hi. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Marco Ramilli. I'm from Italy. I'm a security researcher. And uh, the penetration testing, electronic voting system. I did a lot of penetration testing around. So my question is made by three small sentences. So the first one here is, with this internet voting model, you will never know if uh, your votes have been sold or not. So in other way, so in other way uh, since people can prove what they have vote, you know, just taking a screenshot or recording your screen, they can, you know, sell their vote. Second of all, you need to trust people, platforms around. So in my experiences, I've seen at least four malware that replace the screen of the electronic voting system and makes believe that the voter votes for one candidate, but in, in fact, in the memory, they are voting for another one. The third one is the identity, the card you are using uh, in this way you are using is not doing an identification, but an authorization. So this means that I can let you know, the identification card to my father and say, okay, just vote for me. You know, in normal voting process, this is not possible at all. So the question comes pretty easy. How can you trust this system? Maybe that's something Preet can answer. Yes. Maybe then Let's start with the uh, first um, part of your question about work buying, I understand. Uh, for uh, for the, mm, the, 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 the possibility to uh, uh, fight this kind of a possibility of vote buying is changing your vote, actually. This is the, one of the most important uh, reasons why you have cha uh, uh, changing of, uh, of vote either electronically or going to the polling station and giving a paper ballot. So this is actually a very good system for vote sellers. You can sell your vote for three or four different buyers and then go to the polling station, give a paper ballot or, or just give a fifth um, uh, electronic ballot or stuff. So the, the question of buying and selling is, uh, is possible to solve with changing the vote. And this is always we have emphasized is that the question of the, uh, of the voter, uh, him or herself. So the voter has the choice here, and the voter has the power here. Um, the second question, I think, is uh, about the security issue. Yes, uh, the weakest link in our chain is the personal computer. Yes, and this is one issue that has been a center point in, in all security analysis in, in uh, uh, concerning uh, our system. And that's one thing we have to take into consideration that the voter's uh, computer is the weakest link here. But we have to trust the voter. That the voter is uh, as able as possible to 
uh, I like to see these risks that, 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 uh, um, that are in these, um, uh, in his or her computer. So, and additionally, we are actually uh, searching for new possibilities to uh, fight against these kinds of attacks uh, coming from the virtual computer uh, by improving the central system, by looking at it in the central system. And what about the third uh, issue? I just for it. So, yeah, in, in, well, the, the second one is not just about trusting the voter because maybe the voter doesn't know that uh, he has a malware on his PC, you know. He's just trusting the network, which is, you know, kind of, well, you know, anyway. The third one was uh, the, how can you assure, how can you be sure that, let's say, for, for instance, that I'm really voting rather than my father is voting, you know. The, just to comment on the uh, second aspect too, that um, in order to uh, have a successful attack at the voter application, actually, uh, you will have a window of exactly seven days, actually, because we, we publicize the voter application exactly in the beginning of the voting period, of seven days. So, and for that, you need, the, during these seven days, you have to prepare this kind of malware, you have to distribute it, and it has to be effective, too. So. This is all, all of the, the bargain uh, and end here. Uh, and the uh, third issue is actually a kind of universal uh, problem of the of remote identification, actually. Because you, you can give your ID card to anybody for every kind of, of um, uh, services you're using. And for that, we always emphasize that internet, uh, uh, that the ID card is your electronic identity. This is the most important factor. If you give away your, uh, your ID card together with your PIN codes, this is, um, this is a likely give away your electronic identity. The person can do everything with your life. So this is always, again, a question of the voter himself. Uh, and also to add to this uh, problem that when we look at, for example, Southern European countries where we like it or not, family voting is often uh, seen as uh, quite, quite a no normal way or, or, or it's being tolerated. So that's actually also uh, uh, like a small way of family voting. We cannot diminish it. So, yeah. Uh, I see our Norwegian colleague here in the audience. And Dida, maybe you just uh, would like to comment from the Norwegian point of view. And maybe you just can um, talk about this return code you use to check the, uh, the security of the personal computers. Yeah, the microphone. Oh. Hi, um, my name is Ida, and I'm Ida Sendru. I'm re representing the Norwegian Ministry of uh, Local Government and Affairs. And I've been part of the Norwegian e voting project for two years. And um, I think it was about the second question you had. Uh, the Norwegian solution is that you have um, a return code that is sent to the SMS, by SMS to uh, the phone of the voter. And the voter can compare this code to a poll card that he or she has reserved in advance. And um, you can check that the code is the same because it's four digit. So this is actually um, a good verification that it's the correct vote that is been stored. So many thanks. <laughs> many thanks. Uh, some more questions or, or some reflections? Yeah, Ida. Yeah, I can say one more thing. Um, I'll be talking about the system tomorrow in the White ID conference. Oh, good. Uh, people who are very familiar uh, in IT issues or good uh, technology specialists, they can possibly attend this uh, uh, very high-level conference uh, taking place here in Tallinn in uh, Thursday and Friday. Uh, but now, uh, do you have some comments to each other, remarks, or, or would you like to, to say, say something? I just maybe really yes. comment on the verification issue uh, now raised that uh, yes, we are very well uh, aware of the system that's used in, in Norway, and, and actually there's also 
a very important question this uh, Parliamentary Select Committee is actually discussing at the moment, whether and in what form actually uh, include this, uh, this system in Estonia. But you have to understand that uh, after uh, in introducing that kind of a system, this also changes uh, the, the whole concept of, of internet voting we have had for five, uh, five consecutive uh, elections now. So we have to always look at the pros and cons of, uh, of adding any kinds of new, new uh, developments here. Mm -hmm. But next question. Hi, it's uh, Michael Cross, a UK journalist. A question maybe for Robert. Um, I mean, those of us who have been following this sector for, I don't know, seven or eight years, uh, we, th we look back and we think, you know, uh, internet voting was going to be the future. We're now 2011, and as you say, only one country. Um, looking back, uh, what did we get wrong? What, 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 why were we so over-optimistic? And why is Estonia the exception? so far. Um, thanks, Michael, for that question. I mean, this is now a bit, uh, maybe me now switching hats, uh, less of my official capacity, more of my private uh, opinion here. Um, internet voting, as we have heard from the one side of, of statistics, but also on the other side uh, from technology, has always been a very promising and, and uh, I would even say a visionary concept has been already thought of in, during the Second World War that that would finally make democracy possible if we cite Buckminster Fuller, an architect. Um, so our hopes were very high that there would be a, a revival of democracy in this respect. And I think that uh, over-anticipation of effects, as we have learned, is, is one way why we thought, like, oh, it's going to be very easy. But we have to realize that it's a very complex and interdisciplinary or even multidisciplinary issue where you have to start with the law, as we heard as a recommendation from Prit, and then we have the implementation of technology, and then you learn from the law, as you saw in the recommendations from the OECD, that you have, based on the technology, adapt uh, the law again. So you have this circle. Then you have the political effects of a change and the offerings of voting channels by also this political realism, as we heard uh, from Prit in the first slide, or in one of his first slides, that there is a change of the electorate happening. And that also means there are hopes, there are fears, there are effects involved that you cannot know before using it. So this is one thing where you can see after the evaluation of such trials that things are, uh, you know, you know, also influencing decisions. But I would say the single most influential part why the adoption of internet voting or the introduction in addition to existing voting channels is taking so much longer than everybody anticipated is, it is in the end just an IT project, a very complex IT project that has one special feature. It has to deliver, it has to deliver on time. There is no way of postponing an election as what we see with implementations of other IT projects. So there is a huge pressure. There is a huge attention. If you don't deliver the results right after the closing of the polls, uh, of the polling stations, you already get criticized for that. Also one thing that we saw in Estonia. So you have a very high pressure. You have a very complex issue. And you need one thing, time and experience. And so we, I think we just have to be more patient that we see more or other experiences emerging. I mean, we have heard already about Norway. We will see about uh, Switzerland. So there are plenty of, of um, I would say, small mushrooms that keep growing. They keep popping up at different places. And basically, by everyone learning from each other how it can be done, in the end, it will finally also be this, uh, there will be a solution out there that we know what our standards are for such elections. So we are still developing in this respect. That's what I would say in answer to your question. A small comment to add that actually ID card is actually the cornerstone of internet voting. So without a accepted, a strong, reliable uh, electronic identification system, remote identification system, it's not possible actually to have that kind of system. So 
that's also maybe uh, one of the factors why other countries first start with high cards in the channel means, and then after that come to internet voting. Alex, add something on that. Uh, that's partially true, uh, uh, but it doesn't explain why in Switzerland, for example, you would have successful internet voting implemented where you don't have this ID card. And just add, add something more to this uh, important and, and uh, 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 question on success and failure. What we saw basically in a comparative perspective were some early movers who were to uh, have it all immediately, electronic voting in the, in, the, in the polling places, plus internet voting, plus postal voting, plus uh, the UK is one of these examples. Uh, the Netherlands is another example. And, uh, you know, huge projects bundled. We, we're going to revolutionize uh, voting. And um, internet voting itself in the UK or the Netherlands was never really the big problem. If you look at the history of these, uh, of these reforms, of these massive reforms, you will see that internet voting became most of the time actually a victim uh, because of failures of postal voting in the UK or electronic voting in the in the, uh, um, in the at the stalls in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, whereas in the Swiss case, which I would qualify as a successful uh, gradual um, implementation of internet voting. Um, you will see that uh, lots of preconditions were already met. We already had postal voting in Switzerland. We already had all of that uh, debate prior to the introduction of internet voting about uh, uh, family voting, remote voting, a period of voting. All of these things existed already. So internet voting in the end was just an incremental small step that was added to a full functioning set of, of possibilities. And the same thing um, uh, is true in, in Estonia. Estonia didn't introduce uh, together with internet voting postal voting and, and all sorts of other forms of, of complex systems and they opted just for internet voting and I think that uh, uh, that has to be taken into consideration when we look at success and failure of, um, of these, uh, of these uh, um, early movers. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask one more question from uh, Christian Wessel. Uh, you have discovered using your uh, bottleneck method or model uh, that uh, internet voting does not attract those people who wouldn't vote anyway. And my question is, should it? Because at least in Estonia, the increase of turnout in the meaning that internet voting should bring to vote those people who never participated and who principally do not participate, it has never been the aim. And actually in Estonia, the lack of convenient voting methods cannot be a problem because we have so wide range of uh, several voting channels. There is advanced voting period. It's possible to vote in advance outside of uh, one's home voting station. Uh, it's even possible to vote at home on the voting day or the election day. And so if someone doesn't take part, doesn't participate, probably the problem is not that uh, it's too difficult to participate. Exception here is, of course, the local government election where internet voting is the only way to cast the vote from abroad. Otherwise, uh, these people who are studying temporarily or, or just traveling, uh, like this UP described by Robert before, living in central Tallinn, these could not vote for the city council. But uh, back to the main question. What do you think, as political scientists, should a voting channel a new voting technology attract people who usually, anyway, do not participate. Maybe it's a uh, wrong expectation. No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I'm, I perfectly agree with you. I mean, they, it, a, a mere voting sh channel should indeed not uh, work as a, as a means to mobilize new voters, but it could. And uh, what we have as an, empiric I mean, as an empirical approach, we have, if it has that premise, then one can and should validate or, or, or check whether it has that capacity that is so strongly associated uh, with this channel. So that is. But you know, it's always dangerous to get a person to, to talk and speak normatively, you know. So <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think it's a matter of more of a civic uh, education and all sorts of, uh, of other things. Any different opinions among our panelists? No. One last question. Yes. Okay. Yes, I've, um, 
Okay. If, if everyone agrees that we stay here for maximum 10 minutes, then we can take three questions. I just was to, to Michael. I mean, why is there no f follower? I mean, it could be, I could be cynical. I would say if you are the first one, you get all the credits. You see, if you are the first, if you introduce it, you can say well, nobody else can do that. And you see, of course, uh, internet voting and e-voting is important also for national branding for Estonia. I think that is quite sure. And I lived five years in South Africa. We had to have a soccer World Cup and put a lot of money into that to show that we are able to do um, have certain infrastructure and, and organize certain events. So I think that is one important reason. But I have a question. If you, uh, if you have an experience over certain years, I mean, I'm sh there should be the case that trust should grow. I mean, trust should be consolidated. And the question is, um, why is it not the case? I mean, Netherlands, we, there, was a, there were voting machines for so many years, but the, the trust was not consolidated. What was the reason? It was a, just a a failure of the system. Um, yes, I'll, let me end with it. Can I quickly maybe respond to that? Uh, the question of trust is actually the opposite, to my opinion, because as you have uh, the larger number of e voters coming along, then the early movers are those who trust it excessively. After that, as more people come in, happens what we call regression to the mean. I mean, trust is not you know, most frequent at the extreme values, but it's somewhere in the middle. So as more people come in, so you get more the trust curve clusters around around its mean value. This would be my explanation to this. Uh, and very quickly, because Alex has to go quickly to the... Uh, very quick system. question. I mean, how, how much uh, has Estonia spent on developing this system? And is there a, a business case? We live in difficult times now. Well, yeah, Estonia has developed it, uh, as we saw, since 2003. And so far, as we put everything together, we haven't reached the 1 million euro mark yet. So we have only when, when we speak of, uh, of developing the system and, and, and the, the voter applications, we speak of roughly 800,000 euro only. Um, and so. It's time to conclude, and I'm very sorry, and I'm apologizing uh, uh, because some people wanted to, to ask something, but uh, maybe you will find a chance to do it and to, to ask personally some questions. Many thanks to all of you, and uh, special thanks and an applause, please, to our good panelists, and many thanks for assistance here. Thank you.